Why did we decide that the 80s would be all about traumatizing kids through animation? Yeah, I'm looking at you, Don. It's not like scary stuff had never been drawn before, but if you look at some of the biggest titles of the decade, you can kind of see a shift from the more traditional fairy tale-like movies that had been popularized by Disney, as many films lean towards gloomier color palettes, heavier themes and sequences, and just an overall darker vibe. The Rescuers is, in my opinion, one of the earlier examples of this tendency, or at least a sort of predecessor. Released in 1977, it tells the story of two mice that help a little girl escape from a diamond-obsessed lady that was holding her captive. Upon watching this movie, you may find yourself surrounded by a ton of adorable things. A cute little mouse society that is determined to help the helpless, using thimbles as trash cans and matchboxes as tables, traveling in little airplanes made of tin cans and boats made of leaves, embarking on a journey to save an adorable little girl, coming across all sorts of lovely and helpful creatures like an old cat with little glasses and bayou critters with little aprons and rolling pins. And it's all buried under a lovely little narrative of child abuse. The darker elements of this movie are just as apparent as the cutesy ones, if not more so. And when you stop to think about what's really at stake or what the characters are going through, it hits you less like a cute animal adventure and more like a downright depressing dive into a world of exploitation and neglect. And it's really good! And I want to explore why. Join me as I investigate this cute and terrifying tale as I want to talk about The Rescuers. The movie is off to quite a spooky start as we zoom in on this half-sunken riverboat, nearly lost amongst the equally dark vegetation. Suddenly, a door creaks open, revealing the figure of a little girl. She is surrounded by the bright orange light coming from the inside, but she's covered in shadow, walking cautiously away from the glow. What could make her so scared of whatever hides in the light? Well, the two giant alligators hungrily watching over her already show us that the boat owner is up to no good, but the real confirmation comes from when she drops a bottle onto the river, with the chorus in the background singing, Who Will Rescue Me? The opening credits roll as this bottle travels across the water, with the song playing over it repeating the same question a dozen other times, never receiving an answer. We see her message float helplessly through the waves, nearly lost among ships and storms, miraculously staying afloat until it finally reaches the shore, where it is discovered by mice. This opening sequence tells you pretty much everything you need to know about the movie. Seeing this tiny bottle floating through the massive waves is a stunning representation of our little girl from the beginning. She is alone and abandoned and lost in an environment that is very likely to destroy it. Its presence is so tiny that it's very easily ignored, even though it desperately needs to be acknowledged. However, there's also a lot of strength in these images. No matter how big the waves get or how ugly the storm turns, it simply refuses to sink, and its resilience is rewarded at the end, once the message is finally noticed. We then cut to a UN meeting where representatives from all over the world gather in New York, while mouse representatives of those same countries also gather in a mice UN. And I don't know about you, but seeing mice coexisting with humans while interacting with, like, tiny versions of human equipment is an instant way of lifting my spirits. This is the Rescue Aid Society, a mouse-based organization whose mission is to help those in need. The message from the beginning is brought to them and the mice have to determine who is going to help its author. Miss Bianca, one of the agents, becomes deeply touched by the little girl's plight and volunteers herself to go, as well as picking the janitor Bernard as her partner. The majority of the message was washed out by the water, so the only parts they can decipher are the author's name, which they now know to be Penny, and the name of the orphanage where she came from, so our two agents have to do some detective work in order to figure out where the girl is. The same idea of danger and helplessness expressed in the opening sequence continues, because even though Penny is finally getting the help she asked for, this help comes in the form of two little mice. Two little mice? What, what can you do? 
As they go from building to building in the pouring rain, you're still overtaken by the feeling that these creatures are too tiny when compared to the size of the problem they have to solve. Everything becomes a much bigger challenge for them, from crossing the zoo, to climbing the stairs, to opening a book. It all takes so much effort, and every time they hide inside a drawer or use a comb for a ladder, you are reminded of how small they are and of how big of a task they have ahead of them. But it's also through that same sense of scale that their determination manages to shine. We see that the people in the orphanage have given up on searching for Penny, as her things are just tucked away inside a closet, and with the cat confirming that the police tried to find her for a bit, but stopped the search as well. During a flashback, we see that while other kids have trunks and suitcases where they can keep their things, Penny only has a cardboard box, the same box that has been hidden in the closet. Even when she was still around, she was surrounded by an idea of abandonment. Following the cat's lead, the two mice arrive at a pawn shop, where they find a book that used to belong to Penny, showing that they are on the right track. But before they can investigate any further, in comes our major antagonist, Madame Medusa. Y'all. We talk a lot about the great Disney villains. Sometimes they get even more love than the heroes of their own movies. But I'll tell you, we have been sleeping on this lady. She dominates the screen every time she's pictured. She's impulsive and campy and absolutely unhinged. It turns out that she is the one who kidnapped Penny and she's hiding the girl somewhere called the Devil's Bayou. The mice try to sneak into her suitcase, but lose her as she recklessly drives through the city, forcing them to take a different flight there. In real talk, seeing these two little mice flying on an albatross using a sardine can as a cabin is a whole mood. I've been searching for that kind of piece my whole life. Anyway, their flight is disrupted by the firework set off by Medusa's assistant Snoops, and our heroes fall into the swamp. They are rescued by other critters who are also aware of Penny's situation and have been waiting for an opportunity to help her. The agents are once again confronted with the real danger of their task. They are nearly drowned, shot, eaten, squashed, and then drowned again, coming into full contact with Medusa's violent personality and her equally vicious sidekicks. We are also faced with the true wickedness of our main villain, watching as she rejects the riches she has already acquired in search of an even bigger diamond, revealing just how greedy and controlling she can be. When she talks to Penny, it feels especially painful to see her being so sweet to the girl, knowing she is the one responsible for the kid's misery. And it hits even harder when you hear her belittling the child in that same sickening tone. But nothing compares to the sheer terror of going down to the pirate's cave. The real reason why Madame Medusa took Penny to the bayou is that she needed a child to fit into the hole that leads into an old pirate hideout, and she's been sending the kid down there in search of a specific diamond. And judging by the number of stones in the boathouse, we can assume that Penny has been forced to go there many, many times. With the help of the mice, she finally finds the jewel they were looking for, but the act of actually getting the stone to the surface is way harder than it has any right to be. For starters, the diamond is stuck inside of a skull, which is peak pirate aesthetic, but a total pain to get out. And as the water keeps rising, the clock is ticking fast. This entire sequence is just one scare after the next, and it becomes even more terrible once you remember that no real safety awaits them on the surface, since that's where the villains are. Now that Medusa has the stone, she plans to get rid of the witnesses and flee with it, but she is stopped by the bayou creatures, who all came together to help. Penny's escape has a real sense of urgency to it, and it's really satisfying to watch her finally succeed. The movie brings us to our long-awaited happy ending as the diamond is sent to a museum, Penny is adopted, Bernard and Bianca continue their work as agents, and Medusa is left to die in the swamp like she deserves. Looking back on the events that make up the story, the plot feels like an adventure of a smaller scale, especially when compared to other Disney movies. Penny only really meets the mice on the last third of the film, because the rest of the narrative is just their very long journey of trying to reach her. 
But in that sense, it also feels very appropriate. A lot of the tension in a movie is built around the idea that we are dealing with very tiny creatures, be them mice or children, and the world really does feel a lot grander and scarier than it would for an adult. The story doesn't need to be bigger than this bayou, it's already a lot more trouble than any kid would be supposed to bear. Everything about this plot is covered in a deep feeling of dread. The colors are very muted, and even when they're brighter, it's desolating instead of comforting. Penny might as well have never existed for the people at the orphanage, and her calls for help are so insignificant to the world that only the tiniest of creatures could be capable of hearing them. But there's also a great sense of balance between the darker and the softer aspects. For every action-packed rush of panic, there's a tender moment of the characters caring for one another, and promising to do the best they can to keep each other safe. Medusa herself, as frightening as she can be, also carries a lot of comedy in her exaggerated reactions. There's something really entertaining in just watching her dramatically jump around, and the idea of a woman who has alligators for pets being terrified of mice is honestly hilarious. This mixture of dark and funny, of harsh realities colored by softer moments, creates a delicate harmony that never makes the movie feel too damaging. Of course, this would all fall apart if the rest of the characters were too weak to hold the story together, but fortunately for the movie, they're all perfect for the job. Bernard and Miss Bianca seem like polar opposites, with her being very poised and delicate and with him being an anxious klutz. But they work really well off of each other and you really want to see them win. Penny looks like your typical little girl, but she has a bit of an attitude to her that truly helps create a well-rounded character. Even when she's being dragged back to the boathouse by giant alligators, she looks more annoyed than concerned. She can stand up for herself against Medusa's assistant, but she still retreats into a shyer persona when confronted with the madam herself. They never make her too soft, but don't push it so far that she becomes unbreakable. Besides, the voice acting here is impeccable. I'm not scared of them like you are, Mr. Snoop. It's just so real. When this movie came out in 1977, it was considered a success. So much so that Disney even released a sequel to it in the 90s. And when you look at the journey it went through during production, that fact becomes even more rewarding. Even though The Rescuers became a major feature film, it was initially a smaller project handed to Disney's younger animators, a team led by none other than our future traumatizer, Don Bluth. Don, you sneaky genius. The major inspiration for the plot were Marjorie Sharp's novels, specifically The Rescuers and Miss Bianca. There was an earlier draft of the movie that supposedly followed the events of the first book a lot more closely, focusing on an imprisoned poet, but Walt Disney didn't like how political it was getting, so the project was shelved for a while. The story went through a few more rewrites in the following years. Due to the success of Louis Prima's performance in The Jungle Book, there was a version which involved casting the actor as the protagonist, which, in this case, would take the shape of a bear. This initial idea went through several revisions too, with the bear either being unhappy and sending a message to the mice asking for help, or with him befriending a little girl and sending the mice a message when she goes missing. Louis Prima, however, had a few health complications around that time, which caused the project to be rewritten once more. Still, it's interesting to see how some of the elements carried on to the final version, like the presence of Penny and the idea of sending help messages. Another factor that came into play was that, even though this was supposed to be a smaller project, Disney's top animators became interested in it when the time came to start working on the studio's next feature film. As The Rescuers began taking its final shape, it had become a production of a much bigger scale. Although the story would originally take place in the Arctic, the bayou setting was picked because it would bring a lot more complexity to the scenes and judging by how stunning the artwork in the final movie came out, you can see that the team was really into this idea. We ended up with Madame Medusa as our villain, but there was also a time where Cruella de Vil was being considered for the antagonist role. This idea was ultimately dropped as the team felt it wasn't right to turn the movie into a sequel for the character. 
Still, traces of this vision can still be found in the final movie, like how Medusa and Cruella drive the same car model. Either that, or the animators really didn't want to design another car, which, like, I feel them. But having an original villain for the movie really paid off, as most of the animation done for the character is the work of Milt Call, one of the so-called Disney's Nine Old Men, a team of artists responsible for some of the studio's biggest feats. Milt's work in animation is widely praised, and he did an outstanding job bringing the character to life. He was also behind the work done for Penny and Snoops, and his talent really shows. Judging by how long the idea for this movie had been tossed around at the studio, and how many versions it had gone through, it wouldn't surprise me if The Rescuers had turned out to be a jumbled mess. But instead, we got a movie that is cohesive, touching, and that knows exactly how far it should push its look and characters. The people behind this film saw real potential in it, and tried their best to make this promise shine through. From increasing the size of the production, to assigning its best team to lead it, creating truly memorable settings and characters, managing to scare its audience and comfort it as well. This movie is worth all of the love it got during its release, and all of the praise we can give it today. What else can I say but sign me up to the next Albatross flight! Thank you for watching. Well, hello there. It was very nice of you to watch this video. If you have enjoyed the video, you can do those cool things such as clicking the like button, subscribing to the channel, and clicking the notification bell too. You can also follow me on Twitter and share this video with your friends. If you really like what I do, you should consider supporting me on Patreon. I have linked it down in the description and I highly recommend you check it out. Feel free to leave a comment down below, especially if it is about how much you love the rescuers. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on my next video. Bye! I didn't know where else to fit this flex into the video, so please admire my beautiful collection of rescuer plushies. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much.